Johnson said, there's America, there's the South, and then there's Mississippi. The Mississippi State Sovereignty Commission was Mississippi's spy agency during the Civil Rights Movement. The uh, Sovereignty Commission wanted to know who the activists were in the black community. One of those alone wore nine foot sacks. They were out to stop overt efforts at integration. Down in Mississippi. It's state government itself. We're not just talking about some rednecks on the street are pulling us off. This is defiance at its highest levels. We knew we were being followed. I knew my life was in danger. This is still the United States of America, and you don't treat American citizens this way. How far the Sovereignty Commission went in terms of crossing legal lines, I think it is accurate to say that uh, they cross them all the time. Way down in Mississippi. Jerry Mitchell, what were you most surprised by in the documents that you got? Well, uh, lots of things. The fact that they had spied on, on so many activists, the fact they had spied on mega revers and later tried to help, this, help uh, basically quit the killer in that case, as well as uh, reports on my own newspaper uh, from back in the 50s and 60s. So that was interesting as well. Don Porter, why did you decide to m turn this into a film? Um, you know, when I first heard this story, that there was not only a spy agency, a government spy agency, but that there were also African-American activists who were involved in the spying, I thought, that's a piece of civil rights history that isn't widely known, but it fills in a lot of the missing, it connects the dots in a lot of ways. Um, and I thought people would be interested in it. And I. Um, I just was fascinated by the lengths that state government will go to subvert democracy. I want to go to a clip from your film, From Spies of Mississippi, about one of the people who was spied on by the Mississippi State Sovereignty Commission. We hear from historian Neil McMillan, author Rick Bowers, and Mississippi Congressman Benny Thompson, who was an activist at the time. It begins, well, with our guest uh, in Jackson, Jerry Mitchell. I'll never forget finding the file on Clyde Kennard the young man whose great crime against the state of Mississippi was to apply to go to college. Clyde Kennard was a Korean War veteran, an upstanding citizen who had studied uh, in the northern universities and uh, who was very ambitious and a profoundly decent and, and, and good guy. In the 50s, Clyde Kennard tried to go to the University of Southern Mississippi. In the 1950s, the few African Americans in the South who were able to enroll in college could only attend black schools. Kennard's application to attend Mississippi Southern was seen as an attack on segregation and set into motion a swift response from the state. His application was given to the Mississippi State Sovereignty Commission, an organization few Mississippians even knew existed. They did a report that tracked his background growing up in Mississippi, his time spent with his family in Chicago, his time in the military, his time at the University of Chicago, and his time back in Mississippi helping his ailing mother on her chicken farm. With multiple agents, tracking everybody in his background. They couldn't come up with anything that could undercut his application to go to college. The police, with the cooperation of the State Sovereignty Commission, planted stolen chicken feed from the county co-op, but some, about 20 bucks worth of chicken feed were planted on his farm. He didn't steal them, everybody knows that. But he was arrested for that and he was put in prison for seven years. He was sentenced to Parchment Penitentiary, the worst prison at that time probably in the country. They let him out a couple months before he died of cancer, but only because he was terminal. That Sovereignty Commission did all they could to hold back progress in our state. 
and basically discourage any kind of uh, 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 efforts to bring black and white people together. That last voice, uh, Congress member Benny Thompson. Uh, this is a clip from Spies of Mississippi, directed by Don Porter. So talk more about the Sovereignty Commission, Don. Um, so the Sovereignty Commission is established in response to Brown versus Board of Education, the famous Supreme Court case that allows integration of schools. Um, that case was seen by Mississippi um, as almost a declaration of war. It uh, was viewed as an attack on Mississippi's sovereignty um, and set into motion a vast response from the state. One of the things they did was establish this spy agency. Um, and I think what's so remarkable about this is it was a spy agency hidden in plain sight. Uh, there was an allocation of taxpayer dollars, $250,000, which in 1950s money is serious money. There's an off that reports to the governor of Mississippi. Um, and one of the things they did was hire spies. So in the early years, what you see in the 50s is exactly what happens to Clyde Kennard. Um, his crime was applying to go to a white school. <laughs> and I thought um, it's such wonderful tie-in to the segment you just did about how uh, when a state government feels that its authority, its directions are being uh, challenged, that anything goes. And so they literally ruined this young man's life. I think he had come from the University of Chicago. He wanted to be near his family. Um, he wanted to continue his education and to deliberately plant evidence in order to arrest him and sentence him to prison. Um, I think is just, uh, I wish it was more shocking, but it's certainly terrible. This is another clip from Spies of Mississippi featuring Horace Harded, a member of the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission, beginning with a promotional video about the Jackson Police Department leading up to Freedom Summer. The Jackson Police Department operates with the best demonstration deterrent of any city in the country. In addition to Thompson's tank, armor-plated and equipped with nine machine gun positions, the arsenal includes cage trucks for transporting masses of arrested violators searchlight trucks, each of which can light three city blocks in case of night riots. Police dog teams, trained to trail, search a building, or disperse a mob or crowd. Mounted police for controlling parades and pedestrian traffic. And compounds and detention facilities to hold and house 10,000 prisoners. Along with these ironclad police facilities, there are new ironclad state laws outlawing picketing, economic boycotting, and demonstrating. Other laws to control the printing and distribution of certain types of information, and laws to dampen complaints to federal authorities. We called out the highway patrol and the guard and people like that to keep them in line. We kept them in line. We locked up a lot of them, put them in jail for disorderly conduct, that sort of thing. The jails in Jackson were full, and several other places we had them. I don't mind coming to jail. I don't mind suffering at all. And I will suffer some more just for my freedom. I want equal rights. I want equal rights. We were not intimidated. And I think that's important. If you get intimidated, you can't control anything. That's Horace Harded, a member of the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission. Um, if Jerry Mitchell, if you could talk about uh, who he was and the significance of this commission in, in your state of Mississippi. Well, it was, it was a very powerful commission. It was actually headed by the governor of the state and the state's most powerful leaders. You had uh, people who were in the, you know, the most powerful members of the legislature, the lieutenant governor, uh, you know, all these people that, you know, held the highest offices basically had control of this agency, which had uh, law enforcement powers, had uh, judicial powers uh, to subpoena, to get anything they wanted. Uh, it was uh, frightening from a, from a power perspective. Uh, you know, they had the blessings of the governor on down. I want to go to a clip of R. L. Bolden, who is the former vice president of the Mississippi NAACP, who many believe was Agent X, who reported to the Mississippi State Sovereignty Commission. They claim that I was a spy. 
That, that was a lie. I wasn't no spy. I was worse than shocked. I didn't realize that kind of information was out there because it wasn't true. It's possible that the detective agency was passing on information. I knew R.L. very well. He was the vice president of the state NAACP, and he was intimately involved with us, and we didn't have any signs of indication that he was to the contrary. It was only through the diligence of late, the late Senator Henry Kirksey who began to pinpoint things to determine that he was working with the, the State Sovereign Commission. And that had to do with uh, him digging off into the files and looking at reports and seeing reports being given about certain specific meetings and him reco recollecting who was at the meeting. And everybody's, everybody that attended that meeting were mentioned except one person that he knew was there. And that's when he came to the conclusion that since this is a pattern, that one person who is not mentioned at these meetings that I know was there have to be the one that's submitting the report. That civil rights activist Hollis Watkins talking about R.L. Bolden, who is the former vice president of the Mississippi NAACP. And it turns out, once the documents were released, it was revealed that he was one of the spies recruited by the Mississippi Sovereignty Commission. Don Porter talked more about R.L. Bold and his significance and with the missing uh, three civil rights activists, Shrona Cheney and Goodman. Um, you know, th so the Sovereignty Commission initially starts by having white agents, former FBI men. Then they move on to have high-profile African Americans. Those African Americans were revealed. Um, their identities were revealed. And so the commission realized it needed ordinary people. So R.L. Bolden ended up being an ordinary American, extraordinary spy. He infiltrated the highest levels of the civil rights movement. He was at a very important training that the civil rights activists conducted before Freedom Summer. So In Ohio. In Ohio. So in Ohio, all the students that were about to go south were brought together, and Bolden was at that meeting. He gave the license plate and the pictures of the civil rights workers, Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner. Um, other people also gave the, this information, but he, we know that he gave this information to his handlers. His handlers turned that over to the Mississippi police, and who were infiltrated by the Klan. The significance of that is, I think that the way the Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner murders are often described, it's as if they were pulled over randomly for being in an interracial car, which couldn't have been farther from the truth. They were being targeted by the Sovereignty Commission. Their every move was watched. This was quite a deliberate act to pull them over, um, and you know it results in their murders. It results in their deaths, and one of the most important important events of the civil rights movement, um, which began, which did actually open up Mississippi, but what a tragic way to do it. Jerry Mitchell, what were you most surprised by in these documents uh, that you got, uh, especially around this issue of the recruiting of people within the movement and then those not necessarily in the movement? I want to play one more clip, but who were African American and were leaders and were seen as part of the movement. Let's go back to Spies in Mississippi. This clip includes Lawrence Giat, a civil rights activist in Mississippi since 1961. It starts, though, with Rick Bowers, author of the book Spies in Mississippi. Anytime there's a great freedom movement, there are people who end up on both sides. And if we could transport ourselves back to Mississippi at that time, it was a confusing time. There were many shades of opinion on all the issues related to civil rights. We had a lot of people who felt that there was no way that the civil rights movement could possibly win. So why not get on the winning side early? And others would say, well, the government asked me to do it. Therefore, it has to be legal. The government doesn't do illegal things, does it? 
Lawrence Giat, the civil rights activist in Mississippi since 1961, Jerry Mitchell. Talk more about what they're saying. Well, uh, the, you know, you, you have these spies that, that, that are hired by detective agencies. That's basically how the Sovereignty Commission is able to operate and kind of keep one a bit of distance, if that makes any sense, between them and the spies. So the, the detective agency is reporting back to them, and they actually don't record the name of the spy in the files. Uh, and so that's the way they, they kind of operated and were able to, to pull this off. Um, and I might add, you know, some, they're actually in case of like B.L. Bell, uh, he actually volunteered his services, which I, I know seems very odd. But one of the reasons and one of the motivations for some of these spies was money. They were being paid. Uh, Percy Green, who is an editor for the Jackson Advocate, was actually sent up north and, and, and paid to speak. And he, he and other speakers like him would say things like, oh, you know, we love Mississippi. We love segregation. We love the way it is right now. And so that, the idea behind this is not just spies, but also spreading propaganda, which, of course, like I said, was paid for. Um, the pastors involved, very painful part of the story. Mm -hmm. Tell us. Uh, so Reverend H. H. Hume, really influential pastor, um, a huge congregation and a radio audience in Mississippi. And you have to remember at that time, it was really difficult for African Americans to get that kind of influence. Um, it turns out that he was providing information to Mississippi for um, And I think it speaks to, you know, what Jerry said. Um, there's a particular kind of betrayal when your spiritual leader and a person everyone wants to emulate and look up to turns out to be an, uh, an informant. What do you hope to accomplish with this film? Okay. You know, um, I really hope everyone is outraged by finding out their spies um, during a movement like the civil rights movement uh, that we all now agree led to great freedoms. Um, but I really love the segment you just did. And I think that there's a tie in history. These tactics are not new. The, f the Fourth Amendment and the First Amendment are not convenient. You cannot sometimes have democracy. You need to, you know, these are actually really enemies of our Constitution. And I think that those, when those tactics are still happening today, we need to understand that history.